Well, good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody. Here we are at the Sutherland Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'd like to give you a warm welcome and wish you a happy Sabbath. My name is David Nicholas. I'm one of the elders here at the church. Uh, we're so happy that you could join us, uh, however you're doing that, online or uh, by smartphone, any way that you can manage it. And uh, we just want to go ahead and uh, have a word of prayer now and ask the Lord to bless us this morning. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, once again, we want to thank you for your Sabbath, that we can come apart and rest. We want to thank you for bringing us through this last week up into this day. Uh, we have been blessed. There have been many blessings in our lives and answered prayers, and we thank you for them. And we thank you for the way that you are working in our lives, not only individually, but corporately as a church, as a church body, Lord. We continue to lay ourselves at your feet and praise you and worship you and give you the glory. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as you know, uh, we still have an ongoing health situation with the coronavirus. And so we are not able to meet at the church at this time, so therefore we are doing it all electronically. And I have a few announcements to make this morning. Um, the offering. This week's offering is going to be for the Oregon Youth Support. Have you ever been a camper at Big Lake Youth Camp? If so, you probably remember the fragrance of the forest on a cool Big Lake morning, the cold waters of the lake, the delicious meals in the lodge, and the loud evening programs. You probably also remember the name of your cabin counselor and are likely still friends with some of the other campers you met at Big Lake. You also know that Big Lake Youth Camp is far more than just a great summer week. It's an experience that, and it becomes a part of your life, an adventure that you wish you could have every year. Here's the good news. Whatever you may remember about being at Big Lake in the past, it's even better today. The lake is still cold and the mornings are crisp, but today there are more horses, nicer cabins, hotter showers, and faster ski boats. Classes like kayaking and climbing and wakeboarding will test your strength and there are also uh, trained cabin counselors who will become your lifelong friends. The evening programs, they're even louder and more spiritual than you, than you might remember. Big Lake Youth Camp is just good, plain Christian fun. So this week's offering will be for Big Lake. I'm sure you've been there or know somebody who can go there or has been there. It's a wonderful ministry. And so uh, figure that accordingly in your giving. And now, before we have the offering, remember you can bring your tithes and your offerings to the church office on Thursday between 10 and 12 o'clock. You can mail your offering to the church, or you can drop it off at Nona's house. Just remember that God has given us this church and a mission, and it requires our continued support. You can also pick up your Sabbath school quarterlies during office hours on Thursday from 10 to 12 p.m. or you can go online and the pastor will have something to say about that. Yes, hi, good morning. Well, I want to explain to you how you can get the Sabbath school lesson online. Uh, you know how you can get it by coming to the church uh, during office hours, but I want to show you how you can actually download the Sabbath school lesson just right off the internet. Um, what you have here is a screen from Sabbath School Net. So this is an online website. And what I do is I just put in Sabbath School Net in Google and you will get an option. Let, let's try to look it up together. So Sabbath School, uh, Net, Sabbath School Net. So you just type in that and you will get a screen like that. So you want to go to the adult Sabbath school lesson, which is here on the left-hand column. If you press the button there, then you come right to back to the screen right here. So to get the Sabbath school lesson, it says you can download it from Kindle. Now, of course, 
uh, that's Kindle format, but if you just want a regular format, you actually just scroll a little bit down. Uh, let me see if I can find it. And you'll find a line here that says, download PDF files for each week's lesson at the adult Bible study guide site. So if you click that line there, then you'll come to this page, adult Bible study guide. Scroll down. And you have then several different editions that you can read from, even Spanish, easy reading edition. And then you have the standard edition or the teacher's edition. So you can download either one. And you just click onto it. And here you have two different options, downloading it as a PDF or viewing it online. So let's just go to download PDF. Sometimes people like to print it out, so it's good to be able to do that. So you'll get then table of contents here, and you'll be able to scroll to the right section by just scrolling down. What you can do to actually get your own physical hard copy is to go to the bottom of the page. At least that's the way it is on Apple. Maybe it's different on Microsoft. You see at the bottom, this a little um, thing pops up here, and you just press this thing there. Yeah, that has to be uh, different on your computer. And now I have a physical hard copy of that, starting with a table of contents, and I can actually save that. So that's one way of doing it. Or a simpler way of doing it would be just to read it online. Then you do view online. And that brings you to the first page. So very simple. And this is very good if you have a hard time getting into the church. To get a physical hard copy of it, you can go online and just download it like this. I'll be so happy when we get to meet back here again. It'll be what a blessing that will be. Now, continuing with the announcements, uh, I also wanted to remind you that there's a group that meets Monday to Friday to study the Sabbath School lesson between 7.30 and 8 p.m., and that's on a teleconference. The pastor has sent out a letter with, this, with the information about that, and if you would like more information or help joining the group, please contact the pastor. And there's also a prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 p.m., which is also a teleconference. And it's before the Bible study at 7.30 p.m. Please continue praying for each other and talking on the phone. And if you need any help, please contact the pastor at 1-541-671-3645. That's 1-541-671-3645. And don't hesitate to ask for anything if you need it. Uh, this week, we would like to pray for uh, Pat Wilson uh, has a request for Jim's son. And I uh, also want to remind you to uh, send all your prayer requests to Pastor Andre. So if you would pray with me right now, we'll meet the Lord again in prayer. Heavenly Father, we once again come to you. And Lord, we know that you're always with us and that you care for us. And you never leave us or forsake us. What a blessing that is, the precious promises that you have for us, Father. And this week, especially, we want to lift up Jim's son. Don't know what the circumstances are, Father, but we all need prayer. It's a breath of life. It's a conversation with you. It's a relationship. So, Father, as we go through this week after Sabbath, we have another week to go through. Please guide us through it. Give us wisdom, knowledge, courage, and strength. Help us uh, health-wise, Lord. Help us to be aware of our surroundings and to be cautious. But above everything, Lord, help us to be joyful in you. I know these are trying times and it can be pretty unsettling and stressful, but you have promised that you will give us peace. And so we can claim those wonderful, precious promises. So thank you, Father, for sustaining our lives. Thank you for blessing us in so many ways. And thank you for meeting together with us here this morning. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here together with you, even though we're not here physically. Last week, I talked about fear and 
and, and trusting in God and how God is in the midst um, of our community during these trials and these difficult times that we can trust in him to guide us through these circumstances. Today I want to talk about a crisis as an occasion to prepare. And so this will be on a slightly different but a very, very important topic. Are you prepared for the coming crisis is my title for today. So the first documented case of the coronavirus actually took place November the 17th in Hubei province. It was a man about 55 years old. So about a month before uh, the pandemic started. Um, so it all starts very small and it quickly escalates and becomes a tidal wave that nations are entirely unprepared to deal with. You know, many of us have grown up and lived in relatively easy times. We haven't had a lot of national challenges that have affected our lives. But this is a national challenge that's going to affect every one of our lives. And it's going to affect us for a very long time to come. You know, we've never really faced anything like the coronavirus in our lifetime. In three weeks, the virus has gone from being something that we uh, heard about happening in other countries to being something that was changing America. This virus, as I said last time, could lead to widespread unemployment, perhaps poverty for many families. It could potentially wipe out all the economic gains of the last four years and it could send the nation into deep recession. I was reading um, an article about the financial impact that this virus has on people that actually get the virus and have to be hospitalized. And the article was trying to give a dollar amount for how much that could cost. And I was quite amazed. They were saying how it would cost about $35,000 to treat uh, a patient in the hospital for coronavirus. That's the average cost here in America. Uh, but if there are complications, it would be even more than that. The personal cost, though, after um, your insurance pays its side of it, would be around $10,000. Um, if there are complications, it could be up to $20,000. So it's very, very expensive, and it could break many people's budgets. So this is a time really to, to trust in God, a time to do what we can to make sure that our own health is good. Now I want to talk about why this virus is so unique and also dangerous. And I want to refer to a doctor who is the chair of intensive care medicine at the University College in London, Dr. Hugh Montgomery. <clears throat> he had this interview that I heard that really puts things in perspective. So he says that if you get a normal flu, <clears throat> um, it is likely that you will infect between 1.3 to 1.4 other people. Now that's of course just mathematical. There's no such thing as a 1.3 people. Um, so you will infect about 1.3 to 1.4 people. And once it gets passed on 10 times, you will have passed it on to about 14 different people. So there will be 14 cases of the flu as a result of you. Now, I want, I want you to see how different the coronavirus is. That makes it really, really unique. So if you get the coronavirus, you're likely to infect about three people. Now, this doesn't seem like it's a whole lot more than, you know, 1.3, 1.4. But if you look at how many people are infected, you know, like 10 steps out from you, it's very different because 10 steps out from you, you will be responsible for 59,000 cases of the flu. Um, this is what we call exponential growth. And I didn't really go into much detail about it last time. I wanna tell you a story of a king. Now this is kind of a parable uh, that was told long ago that helps to illustrate the nature of exponential growth. Because really, these, 
mathematical figures are just almost unbelievable. Think about it, 59,000 people. So this parable uh, was told, goes all the way back to about 1256, and it was told by an Islamic scholar. Um, so in this story, there is this inventor of the chessboard, and a king demands that he sell the board to him. So the, the inventor names the price to be paid in wheat. The inventor suggests that one grain of wheat should be placed on the first square. Then on the second square, that one grain should be doubled and two grains of rice should be placed on the second square. And then on the third square, the two should be doubled, so four grains of wheat should be placed. And so every square, that number should be doubled. So two grains on the second, and so on, with the sum doubling in this way over 64 squares. Now, it doesn't sound like it would be a whole lot by the end of it, but it actually is more than you and I can even imagine. The number turns out to be the number on your screen, which is about 18 quintillion, if I've uh, you know, named it correctly. 18 quintillion grains of wheat would be owed the inventor of the chessboard. That would bankrupt the king. So you see, this kind of growth is called exponential growth, and it increases very, very quickly to the point of just overwhelming the system. So that's why this virus is unique and, and dangerous, because it infects so many people. Now, however, the doctor goes on to say that most people will get very mild symptoms. Um, so that's one of the reasons why a lot of people aren't afraid of this. But the problem is that they will also spread it, too. And then some people will get sick at about day 10 of their illness. Some of them will need to come into the hospital where they are monitored. Now, of course, these numbers are much smaller than the ones infected. And even a smaller uh, group will get really sick, and they will need to go into the intensive care unit. And their lives will hang in the balance. So a very small percentage of people will end up in the intensive care unit. For many, that seems like good news. For some people, it seems like they don't have to worry about it. But this is really where the critical issue is. Since we have a limited number of resources, we will be limited in the number of people we can care for properly. In other words, it's going to be really hard to take care of the people that get sick because the number of people that are going to get sick are going to overwhelm our hospitals. They're going to require more bed space than we have, more resources than what we've allotted. So he says that if you are irresponsible enough to think that it is okay if you get the flu, remember it is not about you, it is about everybody else. It's about your impact on the whole community. You passing on the virus to other people, or you being put in the hospital and taking up bed space. So as a country, we are not actually prepared for the crisis because we don't have enough hospital beds, we don't have enough medical staff, and we're being challenged with finding enough respirators and masks and equipment. So our whole system is being challenged. And New York is a prime example of this happening right now. There's another factor, though, I think that's worth considering that makes me think that our country is not ready for it at all. And that is the lack of trust in our nation. You know, if you and I can't trust each other, if we can't trust our politicians, if we can't trust each other, how can we solve a problem this big. I was reading an article about some of the happiest countries in the world uh, that I thought was very interesting and really relates to this particular issue. The article was titled, What the World's Happiest Country Can Teach Us About Surviving the Coronavirus. In order to preserve, persevere through a pandemic, it's all about trust and supporting one another, the author says. <clears throat> For the third year in a row, Finland has been named the happiest country in the world. Other Nordic countries dominate, with Denmark, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden all making the top 10. The secret of their success? 
they are all very high trust societies. John Hallowell, Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of British Columbia, and one of the report's authors told Huffington Post. Any individual who feels that sense of belonging and high trust, which is more common in Nordic countries than anywhere else, is much more sheltered against adversity of many types, he said. So when you trust, uh, you feel more secure. When you trust, you're more willing to work together with others. And in our society, we have really lost that confidence in each other. We've really lost that trust. There is so much conspiracies, speculation about the government being against us. And so because of that, there's not a lot of willingness to cooperate with the government. And so this really hinders us from working together as a team. <clears throat> Larry Brilliant, um, who was one of the epidemiologists that helped defeat smallpox, <clears throat> said this about the current virus. He said that it's the most dangerous pandemic in our lifetime. Those are pretty strong words. Uh, he has never seen anything that's of greater danger than this, partially because of what I've already explained. But this is really what I want to talk about today. I believe that although this is a very serious crisis, there is a far greater crisis coming that is even more important to prepare for. Right now we're in the middle of this crisis, but there's something greater. And I think at this moment in time, we need to reflect upon the greater crisis. We cannot afford to be unprepared for what is about to come upon the world. The coronavirus is peanuts compared to the coming crisis. And the coming crisis will come as an overwhelming surprise upon mankind. And so it is very important for us to be prepared. The crisis in the future will be about religious liberty. We take religious liberty for granted. We've had it for hundreds of years now. It's enshrined in our constitution. It's something we talk about, something that we are thankful for, something that's just ingrained in the American psyche. But according to the Bible, this will not last forever. We see signs already in our society of this basic human right being challenged in various ways and other people fighting for it. This issue will become the greatest issue that mankind has ever faced. We read about this actually in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 devotes a lot of ink to explaining the nature of this crisis, who the actors are, how this issue is going to be enforced. And God gives us all this information because he wants us to be prepared for what is coming upon the earth. And he wants us to prepare others. Let's read it together. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell in the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So in these verses, we see that there is going to be a time when we will not have the right to worship according to our own dictates. In fact, we will be forced to worship in a certain way. And the penalty for not following the, the laws of the government will be death and exclusion 
from being able to buy or sell or participate in the economy. Those people who refuse to go along with society will basically be exiled, exiled from the community. And there will be no other community to go to. They will have to run into the wilderness and escape while being persecuted and being followed. There will be a death penalty and the gov government will go to no lengths to make sure that is carried out. Now, when you look at the greater context of this, this is all in the attempt to secure security, to protect society. But it will be a fundamental challenge to God's kingdom and to God's rule. Because God ultimately is the only one that deserves worship. And at the end of time, it'll be man demanding worship of human institutions. And by asking for us to obey these human dictates, we are actually worshiping the enemy of God. Now this story tells us that everyone is going to be involved in this crisis. This is going to be a worldwide, a universal uh, situation. Now, I really believe that the coronavirus and all other crises that we are experiencing in our lifetime are preparing the way for this final crisis. The things that are happening now are preparing the way for the future. And I think we can see that in what is going on today. We see that the government is really mobilizing um, all of its resources to try to deal with this issue and is imposing laws and, and penalties for those who do not follow these laws. <clears throat> in fact, here in Oregon, it's a misdemeanor for there to be a meeting of more people than what the state is asking for. So you can actually be punished for that. On the other hand, I really believe that God is using this whole situation um, with the coronavirus to alert us, to awaken us to what is coming. The enemy is the inspiration. He is the one that destroys and sends destruction. But God is wanting us to wake up. Wake up to the fact that not too long in the future, society will be mobilized to crush human liberties. Not necessarily <clears throat> with the understanding that this is to destroy but with the idea that somehow humanity can only be saved for this. So people will be thinking that this is a good thing, that it's necessary. But I think in God's eyes, this is a fundamental human right. Because God has created us to give our allegiance first to him and not to man. And when any human power takes us away from us, it's setting itself above God. Now, when I look at the book of Revelation, it seems to me that Revelation lays out a sequence of catastrophes that are to prepare the world for the coming war over religious liberty, the coming crisis about religious liberty. And this sequence of events is described in Revelation chapter 8, through 11. We have seven trumpets that are kind of laid out sequentially there in these chapters. Now in the Old Testament, a trumpet uh, was used for different purposes. It could be used to gather God's people together for various functions. It could be used to gather God's people together for war. So it had the purpose kind of, of alerting God's people, of gathering God's people. What I see here in these chapters is that we have a series of alerts that are, in a way, gathering God's people or alerting them to the final battle, which is described in chapters 12 through 15. 
chapters 12 through 15 kind of describes the final battle in the context of the great controversy between good and evil. So we actually start all the way back at the beginning of this battle between good and evil and look at how it began in heaven. And we go through the life of Jesus and then we come to the church and then we come down to the final battle and how it kind of all ends. But the focus is really on that final battle. So these trumpets are in a way preparing the way, alerting the people, warning the people, gathering God's people so that they will not be taken by surprise when the final battle happens. Now what happens when these trumpets blow is that there are various catastrophes on this earth. For example, the first catastrophe is that plants and trees are destroyed. The second one is that oceans die off, the animals in the ocean. Third one is that rivers and springs are poisoned. So there's, a, there's pollution of our sources of, of drinking water. The atmosphere is uh, polluted. Then there's pain and suffering. And then there's death. So these kind of disasters are trumpets or alerts to this final battle. Now we can look at these as kind of major milestones and they kind of get more and more intense and they're eventually all-encompassing, right? The oceans are affected by it. The rivers are affected by it. The atmosphere is affected by it. Mankind is affected by it. Um, so basically, all life is affected by it. And it gets increasingly intense until there's death, mass death. Um, so here we have these warnings that are preparing the way for the final crisis. Now, this does not mention, you know, plague, doesn't mention pestilence. But in a way, pestilence and plagues and all those kind of things are examples of the birth pangs that are pointing towards the final events. So they're part of this picture that prepare the way for, for the end. So I believe that God is calling us to wake up. These are wake-up calls. God doesn't want us to be caught off guard. God wants us to be ready. God wants us to wake up, to be alert. Now the question arises, what should we wake up to? You know, what should we be alert about? This is a really important question. We shouldn't have any vague notion on this point, we need to know clearly what it means to be awake, how it is we ought to live. What is God trying to say to you and me? I would like us to turn to Romans chapter 13, verse 10 through 14. And we're going to look at what God says about being awake. <clears throat> In verse 10, Paul writes, Love does no harm to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Let me draw a few lessons from this passage about what it means to be awake. The first lesson is that time is short, and therefore we ought to have a different perspective about life. If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow or the next week, would that change the choices that you make? Would that change your life? Yes, very much so. Knowing that you don't have long to live puts things in perspective. You will not have time to watch junky TV shows 
You will not have time to waste your hours playing games. You will not have time to spend time on things that are of little significance. You will want to maximize your time with your family. You will feel that your obligations to God are supreme. Knowing that our time is short is an essential part of being awake. But being awake is not, in this context, about knowing that you are going to die. No, in fact, it is about knowing that your salvation is coming soon. We live in a dark and dangerous land, a place where there is very little security. No matter what country you live in, you can die any minute. You can die of a heart attack, you can die of a stroke, you can die very quickly. Your life tomorrow is not guaranteed. Your life the next moment is not guaranteed. So we live in a dangerous and dark place where there's temptation, where there's much to lead us astray. But Paul says that the day is coming soon. We are moving fast, very fast, towards the second coming of Jesus when we will be together with God forever and we will no longer be suffering in this world. Our salvation is coming soon. Jesus is going to rescue us. Therefore, that should change our perspective. If we knew that Jesus was coming tomorrow, how would that change our lives? Would we not prepare for that? Yes, there is a preparation that is necessary. We need to wake up. <coughs> the next point that he makes is that waking up is about realizing that you and I are called to live like Jesus and live out his character of love. Yes, God has given us the law of love, and when we love, we fulfill his law. This is the life that we are to live. We are to put on Jesus. We are to put on his lifestyle. We are to put on his character of love. And we are to live like he lived. This is what we're called to do. This is what it means to be awake. We are called to live like Jesus. We are called to live out his character. And then finally, living like Jesus means something very particular. It means we are called to wake up in order to fight on the side of Christ for the salvation of others. Jesus has called us to persuade. He has called us to persuade our neighbors, to persuade our friends, to persuade our community to turn to Jesus, to turn to the living God. We are called to wake up, to give our lives to him in service to our fellow man for the salvation of souls. So an awakened person is a person who has taken on the armor of God to fight the battle for people's salvation. That is what it means to be awake. If we're not engaged in this warfare to try to save other people, then we're not actually awake. You and I have all been called to fight this battle, and it can only be fought through much prayer and through persuasion, talking to people, and through good works, loving people. But the work of persuading, the work of loving people, is a work that we cannot give to other people. It is our work. We are called to awaken. Now this time that we are in right now, I believe, is really a time of preparation. It's a downtime, a downtime when we can't do many of the things that we're used to doing. Many of those things that take up so much time, like going to the grocery store and spending hours in the grocery store, going to other stores and spending hours looking for things. There are many things that we can't do, so we have a lot more downtime. And this time is given to us by the God Almighty to prepare for the future. God wants us to be awake, and we need to prepare ourselves to be awake. 
because we are called to help others to be awake, to prepare others for what is about to happen. And so we have this downtime. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to just use it frivolously, waste all of this precious time that we have? No, I believe this time is given to us for the purpose of preparation, and so we need to use it wisely. I want to go back to a story in the Old Testament about a group of people that actually abused an opportunity that God gave them to be awakened and to prepare themselves for the work that he had for them to do. You know, we read about this in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Israel missed her opportunity to prepare herself. This is really a tragic story, a vital story for us to study because it helps us to reflect over the choices that lie before us. Will we also miss out on our opportunity to prepare ourselves? Or will we use this opportunity to seek him? You know, God led Israel into the desert for them to have downtime with him. They were together with God. They didn't have all the distractions that they had before. The desert was a solitary place, much like the quarantine, in quotation marks, that we're in right now. They were there alone. They were no longer in a place where they were surrounded by the, the sounds and the sights of a, of a great nation a nation with a lot of culture, with a lot of wealth, the hustle and bustle of life in Egypt, the busyness that they were forced to engage in. They were constantly at work in activity as slaves. They had no time for the things that were of most importance. And that was their relationship to God. They were burdened, burdened by the busyness of life. The busyness of life was keeping them occupied so they didn't have time for God. And God freed them from this. He gave them quiet time, lots of it, in the desert. One of the first lessons God taught them in the desert was the necessity of Sabbath rest. of taking time away from the survival activities of life to be with God. They were asked to take a whole day to be with God. They were asked to spend their time with Him. But they also needed more than this. He set up an abode, a tent, in the middle of their camp where he would dwell and he taught them to include him in everything they did every single day their life together with god with him in the center of their life was to be a lifestyle it was to be something they were reflecting on when they left their house and when they went into their house at every occasion when they were with their family they were to talk about God, and God was to be the center of their lives. We have many examples in the Bible of individuals who took this plan to heart and really sought intimacy with God. Because that is what God wanted. He wanted intimacy with his people. <clears throat> we have the example of Moses. Moses, this incredible leader who actually had face-to-face -face contact with God. God spoke to him face-to-face. -face. What an intimate relationship. We have Daniel, much later in history, who prayed three times a day to God, who sought him consistently three times a day. We have David, who sought the Lord in his trials, and got specific guidance for how to do things. And he was called the man after God's heart because he had this very close relationship with God. 
these three individuals and many like them are really examples of the kind of relationship God wanted to create. Israel was given this opportunity for intimacy with God by being brought into solitary isolation. You know, we need that at times. We need to break away from our busyness and take time to realize who God really is. Now, Israel didn't take the advantage of this opportunity that God had provided. No, they, they wasted it. They misused it. Two things happened. First of all, they complained. Instead of finding contentment, instead of surrendering to the new situation that they were in, they were always complaining. They were always at, not at ease. This was a great problem because if you're not at ease, if you're not surrendered to the situation and, and you're complaining all the time, how can you connect with God? How can you have that intimacy with him? It's impossible. One needs to surrender. One needs to say, okay, God, these circumstances are not circumstances that I would have chosen, but I believe you want to teach me something through them. And so I surrender. And I will learn to trust you. I will learn to walk with you. Another thing that Israel did was that they went after false gods. Um, they felt abandoned by God in this situation. Moses was up in the mountain. They were down below. And they weren't so sure that Moses was going to come back. And so they felt abandoned, not only by Moses, but they felt abandoned by God. And so what did they do? They began to seek false gods. Now, these false gods were like the distractions that we struggle with today that distract us from spending quality time with God. Now, look at it for a second. Let's look at Exodus 32. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molten calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So here you have Israel getting distracted. Instead of spending time with God, they are rising up to eat and drink and play. They don't take this as a serious opportunity to have a relationship with God. Instead, they please themselves. They find gratification in doing their own will. They get up to eat and drink, and they rise up to play. Now, had Israel prepared itself by seeking God, I believe that they would have won the battles that they were confronted with. Israel did not take the time to really seek God. They failed so miserably in their lives as a result of this. Instead, they lose the battles that they were confronted with. Time and time again, we see this. They fail God. I want to look at some examples here. So, in the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verse 11, we actually read that Israel leaves Sinai. So they were at Sinai for a long time until Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. And we read here, Now it came to pass in the twentieth day of the second month, in the second year, that the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle of the testimony. 
And the children of Israel set out from the wilderness of Sinai on their journeys. Then the cloud settled in the wilderness of Paran. So Israel basically leaves this place that they had been at together with God and received all of God's commandments and laws. And they enter on this journey and they begin to face different circumstances on their way to the promised land. Now observe what begins to happen here. Not long after they leave, Israel is overcome by their appetites. You know, they began to really struggle with their food. They were tired, tired of the manna. They wanted meat. They were overcome by their appetites and began to complain to God. And God gave them what they wanted. And they just gorged themselves on it. And many, many people died as a result of it. Had Israel spent time with God, had Israel prioritized their relationship with God, they would not have been overcome by their appetites. The next thing that we see is that Israel was overcome by dissension. Numbers chapter 12, we read about this. Dissension comes in the camp. Miriam and Aaron begin to speak against Moses because of his wife, whom he had married. And they say, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. So they began to complain, complain about their leader, feeling that he was leading in the wrong way, that he was taking too much authority to himself. Dissension starts to arise in the camp. Why? Because they had not spent time with God, because they had done their own thing. They had not prepared themselves for what they were to face. In Numbers chapter 13 and 14, we read that they sent out spies into Canaan to surveil the landscape, to find out what kind of land this was and what kind of enemies they would face. And as we know the story, only two of them came back with a good report. The rest of them said, you know what, we can never take this land because there are great giants and there are walled cities and we will fail. And so we see that Israel is overcome by fear because they're able to convince the whole nation that these enemies are too big to fight, too big to conquer. If we're not spending time with God, if we're not preparing ourselves, we will also be overcome by fear in our lives. We will not have the courage and the strength to do what God bids us to do that we will fear the enemies. We will fear the problems. We will think that things are impossible. And we will, breed, we will breathe our doubt in our board meetings. We'll breathe our doubt in our Sabbath school meetings. We will breathe doubt by our very presence when we gather with God's people. God wants us to be optimistic because we have a God who is in charge. We have a God who cares for us. We have a God who is working through us. But we need to spend time with him. Finally, and this of course is not the final story, but there's a kind of sequence here. In chapter 14, you know, Israel says, well, you know, God, we're so sorry that we doubted you, that we became so controlled by our fear. God, we're willing to go and take the enemies now. You know, just give us a chance and we'll fight the Amalekites and God will help us. But God had said no. No and they were overcome by their enemies completely. So we see that as a result of not spending that time with God, they were overcome by their appetites, they were overcome by their, I guess you would say their pride and the dissension that resulted, their fears, and then finally their enemies. They could not stand 
against their enemies. They were overcome because they didn't put God first and they didn't prioritize their time with God. They allowed other idols into their lives. You see, this is our struggle too. This story was actually written for us. Can you believe it? God actually recorded these stories because he knew that they would be very, very useful for me, for you, for all of us. Because this story would help us to understand the issues in our own lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So these stories were written especially for those who are followers of Jesus, for those who are doing Jesus' will. We are faced with the challenge of things that can easily become our gods. We easily spend time with things that distract us from our relationship with God. The source of our power, we need to be reminded of this, is from spending our time with God. That is where the source of our spiritual power comes from. You know, the upper room experience really illustrates this very clearly. In Acts chapter 1, we read about the disciples after Jesus had died and was resurrected and rose before he rose to heaven. Look what Jesus instructs them to do. So this is before Jesus went back to his father. He says, it says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was telling them that their source of power would only come to them as they spent time with him and waited upon him. That was a necessary prerequisite for them experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to spend time with Jesus. Time is so important. Now, the coronavirus, it is a wake-up call. It's an invitation to spend time to prepare ourselves for what is about to come. You know, success, success in the spiritual life is not something that you and I are born into. It is not something that we just inherit. We have to prepare for it. You know, it's not the result of... uh, haphazard short-term exertion, but deliberate practice. I was watching a short uh, documentary just a few minutes long um, on BBC about kind of people's understandings of success. You know, at times success has been described as something that is achieved because of inborn talents. What research has shown is that success is really something that you gain through concerted, um, deliberate practice. It is through intentional effort that success is gained in almost every field. The researchers were talking even about child prodigies. You know, often we think, well, they're successful because they have this natural inborn talent. But then they point to the fact that many of these prodigies, they were actually mentored by their parents who pushed them and pushed them and gave them the necessary advice that helped them to be deliberate in their practicing. And they were saying that this kind of deliberateness is very different than just going out and, you know, shooting golf with your friends or playing basketball with your friends and doing that on a daily basis. Because you get into these routines that you don't get out of. 
But to really excel at something, you have to be constantly pushing yourself towards improving, towards getting better at something. And this requires being very deliberate about it and having a coach to help you. My point right here is that we need to be more deliberate in our spending time with Jesus. Jesus is wanting us to go further than we've ever gone before. We need to be deliberate about our time with God. Now, t- spending time with God can be done in basically three different ways. Um, reading his word, which is his word spoken to us. Praying to him, which is our word to him. And then memorizing the scriptures. Spending time actually storing up the word of God in our mind. These are ways in which we can be deliberate about our time together with him. God wants us to be serious because this is a time of preparation. I want to end with a story that is a powerful reminder of the fact that God is calling us to spend time with him. The story is taken from a book called Ordinary People, Faithful God. Um, it's printed by one of our publishing houses. And the story is about Tanya. Uh, Tanya, from her very young age, wanted to help people. And she wanted to become a nurse when she got older. She grew up in a non-Christian household, so she didn't learn about God through her family. But she, but she learned about God at school, and she says that it really put seeds in her mind. Even though she went um, <clears throat> to a public school, there was some religious instruction. Her parents eventually separated, and that was a real crisis in her life. And after the separation, she and her sister asked her dad if they could go to a church. And the dad nearly fell back in his chair. He was really shocked. He was not so happy, but he said yes to it. Uh, And so they went to church, and they, they only went a few times, but they really felt safe there, and they felt close to God. But you know, as you got, they got older, um, got busy with worldly things, partying, drugs, and alcohol. At the age of 21, she had a nervous breakdown, and she had tried to commit suicide. She came to the point where she just cried out to God for fear of where her life was heading. And um, the only thing that really mattered to her anymore was, was helping people, being a nurse. That's what she cared about. So in her studies, she would work with patients, and uh, some of her patients, you know, were pastors, priests, religious people, and she would always have questions for them. But basically, after those encounters, she kind of would stop thinking about God. So God was just an occasional thing in her life. But then at the university, um, she met a young man who she fell in love with, and she was convinced that... He was the right person to marry. Little did did she know, he was actually a Christian and grew up in a Christian home. And he changed her life because he was able to answer many of the questions that she had. And so she began to give her life to God. And this all crystallized when she had her first child. Now, in their early days of being married, she really questioned this, this idea about resting on the Sabbath. You know, she was going to school. She felt like she needed all the time that she could to study and to take care of her family. She had so many assignments. It was very difficult for her to keep up with everything. Then one day, something happened. Uh, One Friday night after sunset, she sits down to complete an assignment uh, that she knew in her heart she should not be doing on the Sabbath. So she had this inner conviction that this was not the right thing to do, but she decided to do it anyways. Even though she had that feeling that God was calling her to rest. Five hours later, she looked uh, over her work and she was proud to finish. And then she finds out that she had answered the wrong questions. And all of her answers were therefore incomplete and incorrect. 
She had just wasted five hours of precious time and had accomplished nothing. She was so angry about this whole situation when an impression came into her mind. I have to make changes in my life, she began to realize. Where are my priorities? Do I want a career in nursing or do I want a relationship with God? So for her, the question was very stark. It was one or the other. I knew God was giving me a choice. I had to choose. At that moment, nursing was my God, and my Father in Heaven was not. Now, she struggled with this, and she struggled with it for a while. She could look back over her life, and she saw that God had been with her all these years, that God had directed her path. But she knew inside that she could not commit to both pursuing this career and to God. And so she made the decision to choose God. Now, it came with many hurdles. Her professors tried to convince her otherwise, and they laid up all sorts of plans for her that would help her in, you know, being able to do both. But she felt that God was calling her to be a steward of time, particularly of time to have a relationship with him. So five years later, um, she looks back over her decision and she praises God for the fruit that it bore. Because she had the joy of watching her friends give their lives to God. She had the joy of watching her sister give her heart to God. As a result of her choosing God and prioritizing time with him, she was able to witness to them and invest in eternal things. As a result, she actually developed a ministry of giving out free books and, and helping people with spiritual things. And one of the greatest joys was actually helping her children, raising them, training them in the Lord to desire heavenly things and preparing them for heaven and for eternity. And so she says that I shudder to think what my life would have been if I had not made that decision. When we make time for God, time is more beautiful for every other area of our lives. And so I want to challenge you. We have more time to spend with God. God is calling us to seek him on our knees, to seek him more than we've ever sought him before, because the great crisis is coming very soon. Jesus is coming very soon. These events that we're experiencing right now are building up towards that climax. And here we are with more time. God is calling us to use that time for him. I just want to urge this upon you. You know, God wants us to take life seriously. We don't know how much time we personally have. Therefore, it's incumbent on us to use our time for what is most important. I want to pray together with you. The Bible actually urges us uh, to redeem time. That is to, to rescue time from frivolous things for the sake of God's work. And we need help to do that. And so we want to end by praying that God would help us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I believe that you are talking to each person who's listening to this talk and that you are laying on them the burden of putting you first. You are urging upon all of us that these times are very serious and that you are calling us to be on your side and to work together with you, but that we need to prepare our hearts. And so I want to ask, dear God, that you would help us to use this special time when we have more time to be together with you and to make you first and best in our lives. Oh, God in heaven, help us. We truly want to be your servants. We truly want to have the power that you have promised your church. Help us, Father, to make that commitment, to be intentional, to be disciplined. Father, thank you for hearing my cry. 
We were like children. We need you to teach us. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.